Good morning, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks, Stefan, and everyone at Area 41 for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my, name is, my name is Mark Benziger. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my bias going into this because it affects what I'm hoping to get out of it from you, and be, also it affects uh, sort of the why I'm approaching it from this. So I come from an, from an incident handling and incident response background. I was a pen tester and a more traditional security operations guy before that. But for the last 10 years, I've really been focused on the belief that it's the, in the detect and respond cycle that we, we can have the greatest effect, and it's where most of my interest has been. Uh, I've been doing a lot of SOC design or exposed to SOC design. I use the word SOC with a question mark because it's a stupid word and it's been around for 10 years, and we use it to sort of interchangeably to talk about organizations that worry about finding and responding to evil on their network. And I, I'm really focused on the detection response. I'm not thinking about vulnerability management or security operations like firewall provisioning. I'm thinking about detect and respond. And that's what this is focused on. I like agile solutions. I want, I, I, I definitely, uh, the idea of process over people is important and it informs why I did this because I feel like we've, we built some really, really Byzantine complex solutions to solve problems, and they don't always work because of the complexity. That's my, my Twitter handle. I, sadly, I don't use it that much, but please feel free to, to ping me there, or, or you know, I, I don't, I, at least I don't tw tweet much, but maybe I'll try more, I hope. Uh, that's my email address. I work for FireEye. Obviously, this talk is not condoned or sanctioned by them. This is just about the th my experiences both there and at some previous companies. So this, this talk isn't about products. It's not about uh, tools that you use necessarily. Like the, so as, I, as I get through, you'll see that I'm going to talk about tools several times, but it's more about process and ideas. The, uh, and so this is the, the last thing. It, it's been really intimidating to see the quality of the talks I've, I've seen here and talking to many of you because there's some really insanely smart people in here. And they're doing, they have, they're part of some pretty advanced programs to find, find evil and respond to it. And so my experience has been that, that the vast majority of organizations do not have multiple malware reverse engineers on staff, but some of you are part of organizations that do, that do have that flexibility. Uh, this is about, this is for the organization that doesn't have multiple malware reverse engineers on staff. They have one guy who's made his, what made it halfway through practical malware analysis and keeps promising himself he's going to go through the whole thing and figure it out one of these days. Where the, the SOC team is 10 people and they don't have a lot of depth or skill and they have very narrow, narrow abilities. So what, what led to this talk? I, I'm so tired of the, of the phrase threat intelligence and, and I'm gonna, I use the word cyber all over just because it is the language that people, at least industry is speaking in. They say cyber threat intelligence or threat intelligence interchangeably. And uh, I hate the pra I hate the word. It, 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 I don't know. It feels overloaded. And I'll talk a little bit about my frustration with the word intelligence for this. But it is what it is. We, we have to. We have to live with it. Uh, it. And a lot of too many organizations are spending a ton of money on these things. They're focusing on the the you know they, they'll pay a half million or a million dollars a year for a threat intel feed. They'll pay you know a quarter million dollars for a, a strategic intelligence service to assess their business and give them periodic reporting. They'll build or buy crits or big data tools and spend a lot of money in maintaining and using them. Tons of money is going into this and it's not always having a lot of value out in the field. Uh, and so I, I say this as someone who works for a company with a, a threat intel offering. It's a useful thing. I mean, and I've seen it help at companies. I'm not saying threat intel is bad. I'm just saying it's, it's underutilized. And this is a little bit of a talk about Maybe we don't need to focus on the big, the big adversary quite as much, but look a little bit inwards as well. And it's, and it's for all those overwhelmed SOC analysts who don't know where to start. So some, word, some thoughts about the word threat intelligence, or just intelligence in general. It's a horribly overloaded word. Uh, when, I, when I'm using it in this presentation, I'm not talking about really, really smart people. I'm not talking about nation states or scary oligarchies spying on us. I'm, I'm not talking about secret services trying, or, or people spying on their own companies. Uh, I, I'm trying to come up with a better word, and this, this, this problem comes up frequently in Germany. Uh, I, uh, so I, I come, I'm obviously an American by the accent, but I, I've been in Germany for roughly the, fast, the past four years, and I come from uh, Europe, European parents. So I, I have, 
I, I've picked up enough of the language to start spotting like where the breakdowns happen. And so I, I was trying to think of a word that's better to describe in German, intelligence, and it's a beautiful mouthful of a German word, Auffassungsvermögen. Um, maybe that's it, I don't know. So I tried summarizing in English roughly what I mean. How can I, how can I use data efficiently to make the right decision? And, and the key words are the right decision and efficiently. Like how can we do this quickly? So please be patient with me. I'm, I'm you know, almost uh, five minutes in, and I'm still, I'm still on the introduction. So I, I'm getting there. I'm painting a picture for a reason. Uh, the, there's no demo. I'm sorry. I know this is my first talk at a con, and, and I thought that the demo gods would laugh at me if I even tried spinning up a, uh, a Crits instance and a Elk instance and a ZM and tried linking them together on the stage. It would be bad. So. Uh, please, maybe next time. Uh, and so at the end, I'm going to ask some questions because this is, this is based on personal experience and a couple of different attempts in the field. Uh, but I'm, I'm a data point with, I've got maybe 10 different socks I've been exposed to in the last five years. So if there's, if others of you have experience that, that conflicts with this or supports this, I'd love to hear it afterwards or during the Q&A session. So still, still in the background, we, we ha I use the word framework here uh, loosely. Uh, frameworks aren't necessarily, uh, framework can be a document, it can be a regulatory thing, it can be an idea. So some of these things are not like the others. Obviously some of them are frameworks for measuring things, some are, uh, thing, some's are, organi some are organizational that enforce things. But they all end up creating, or all end up almost mandating some sort of process for how, well, how do we take in something from detection to response? And, and so I tried distilling like the absolute minimalist beginning of that detection and response cycle where it's most, most important. You find something, probably a ZM rule, most likely. Unfortunately, sometimes a phone call from the FBI or from BSI or some other organization. Uh, then you take a look at it and say, how, how, you know, do I understand this? Is it really an incident? How big is it? Is it scary? Do I have enough information? And then if it's big and bad, you analyze it. Maybe you do something about it. And if it's if it's just a, if it's if it's a garden variety malware, you say, yeah, reimage the box, close the ticket, move on. And if it's a false positive, you say, hey, our rules are broken, do something about it. So there's a, there's a group of intelligence frameworks and methodologies again, and I'm I'm clumping them all together because some of the some of these are purely technology solutions, but they drive towards ways of how we look at data, and so. The ones I'm going to use, I apologize in advance for using the kill chain. I know you're tired of it. Uh, everyone is, but it's still a, a really effective way to model, to model threats and and make and re, and particularly look at targeted threats where you're worried about the, where you, where you can afford to worry about the infrastructure or the capabilities of the adversary. I'm going to talk about the diamond model. Uh, some most of you have probably seen that as well. It's a pretty useful way to look at again, attacker and victim. And I'm going to lock, talk a little about technology-based solutions. And so there's all of these. This, it's been great, actually. I think five years ago, I was, I, was, I was dying for something that allowed me to keep track of all of the thousands of indicators I was trying to deal with and had no central way to say, yes, this showed up on this threat feed this day and went away on that day, and this IP address belongs to this threat group but not that threat group. And oh, by the way, it's the, you know, all of those little pieces of information, there's tools now to manage that. And, I, I'm, and they're very good at drawing links between different pieces of discrete pieces of data. Uh, the ones I'm, you know, so lots of link diagrams. Crits and Avalanche are the ones I threw up there, but there's like three other ones. And, and those are the two ones I'm most familiar with, so that's the ones I'll refer to. And then there's the big database approaches where people store ridiculous, truly ridiculous amounts of data to and try and, and build analytics to find things. And, and I, I'm, I'm kind of amazed sometimes by the, the size of, of some of these efforts. Uh, there's been a few, uh, one company was in the US uh, about six years ago, they had three years of, you know, for 100,000 for 100, people, all their net flow, all their email headers, all their DNS, all their HTTP, uh, get get requests every you know every all their proxy logs and they they maintained them for three years and they were committed to maintaining them indefinitely and just keep building that because they treat it as a giant data analytics problem to find badness and of course the last which is white papers things to help you make decisions where someone else takes all of these different things and 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 distills it down to something that actually people can make a decision on 
So kill chain, really, really simple. Uh, the idea that there's lots of steps in an intrusion and that it's, it's not about, and this is the most common, common misconception, it's not about defense in depth, it's not about uh, being able to break it early on the kill chain, it's a way for modeling how the adversary is dependent on infrastructure to attack you. Every step here, you can find things about, about their, their method of attack, whether it's a specific, you know, some metadata from a document, an IP address, a mutex, from these different phases of the attack. And every single one of those pieces represents a, a piece of work that the attacker had to take to build something. He had to, he had to go ahead and, and own someone's box and confirm it was a safe place to put a C2 controller. He had to do the research for some sort of exploit and ensure that no one else was using it and that it was, that it was likely to get past whatever it was. Every little piece of this represents someone, someone's, some piece of work. So by, by treating it as disc discrete columns of information, you can start uh, drawing connections because replacing any of these chunks takes work for the attacker. So they're, they're not inclined to replace pieces. So if you can find ways to draw connections, you can draw conclusions about the attacker. So you have your first alert, and, I'm, and the reason I'm going through this is because I'm gonna use this data in some of the later presentations. I know you, most of you know this. You have something, your, your EMET, EMET fires on a system and says, hey, I stopped something that was bad. That's it, that's all you got. Some, some memory-based exploit. And so you, you do the research and say, oh, it looks like an email came in and he clicked on this Excel document, and, uh, and there's something in it that maybe was bad. And, and actually, this is, a, this is a poor example. I mixed, uh, when I was drawing this, I mixed two two alerts, obviously an Excel macro-based exploit is probably not gonna give you an EMAT log, but bear with me, the idea is that there's some connection between the two. Uh, you, and, you, and you have no idea how, they, how the recon's tied to it. You, you, know, you can't guess about web logs or something that, that might have been connected to that in the beginning. And so then you, you do a little research and you, you reverse engineer the, the actual malware and say, okay, if this thing actually ran, it's, you know, or maybe put it in a sandbox, probably not reverse engineering at this point, figure out, you know, oh, it's, it's gonna leave this registry ent entry and you know, have this service and it'll connect to these things and I can build a signature on it. So you build a, a picture of it and this entire, each chunk here represents some part of the adversary's infrastructure. So then you start doing, you start building up a long picture of a different attacks and you start getting you know, you say, hey, I triggered on this signature here, I found an IP and a URL, and then I, I walked back, couldn't figure out the exploit because I don't actually keep track of my, I don't have full packet capture, so I have no idea what was actually in that. But I found a little bit of information from this, maybe a different flash attack here. I found something in the registry, perhaps and based on some other signature. And so you start building this picture of different chunks of adversary activity. And then the day comes when you, when you spot the link, when you say, hey, this IP address here, that, you know, that, that looks like the, the forwarding, uh, you know, some IP address that was forwarded from happens to be the same that was an exfil IP used a year later or six months later, and sometimes they're completely unrelated, but sometimes you start drawing the tie because, as I said, attackers are cheap. If they don't have to, re if they're cheap and lazy, uh, if they don't have to rebuild infrastructure or rebuild code, they won't. So we get here and, and, we, and we dump it into crits or something else and we model it and say, look, these, these two IPs, it actually show up as one IP, but I've left them with both colors to represent, hey, there's two different discrete events and they're tied to these different things. There's some sort of linkage between all of these different things that tells us, hey, there's, there's a chance the next time I look at, you know, I spot this thing, that maybe it's tied to these. And we use these beautiful link diagrams and these big repositories of historical information to find where what the tie is to something happened previously. Another way of looking at this is the diamond model. And so this is, and I have to say, if, you, if there's any one piece of information that informed this talk most, it was thinking about the diamond model and how, uh, how we're, we don't seem to focus on that part of it very much. And the, so this is uh, work of Sergio Caltigaron and um, Christopher Betts and Andrew Pendergrast, and it's, it's really helped me a lot. It's, it's, it's really some great mechanism. It, it basically says that every piece of, atta every attacker, every attack has these four things associated with it, that you can't avoid the fact that somehow there's a, there's a tie between all of those things. And so you can look at the sort of the technology access, the idea of the infrastructure, hey, they have to own boxes in order to upload things. 
They have to, to, they have, to have something that can write, craft their emails and send their emails. And they have some capability. They have some ability to, to write code, write exploits, embed exploits, package them in some way, and send them to you. And send them to you. So all of these pieces are associated with the capability piece. And then we have this access. Now, in the, in the, pa in the original paper, it was described as socio-political. And it, it's, I, I like, and they also refer to it as motivation. I prefer looking at it that way. Like, what is the motivation? Why is this happening to me? And, and so you can, you can make some conclusions here about the adversary. You can say, hey, this, this guy seems to reconstitute IPs when we block them really fast. And his locale, you know, there's little hints of locale information linguistically or time zone or something that's in, embedded in some of the documents. Hey, this is some, this is some really good, this is really good code. I, you know, I, I wasn't able to figure out anything. All of the headers were obscured and it was really, really tough and it seemed to be sandbox aware. And you can guess maybe there's, there's a pattern, you know, all of the attacks come in UTC plus eight or plus 10 or whatever it is that makes you go, Okay, maybe, that, maybe that's tied to something. So you draw some conclusions about the attacker, and hopefully that lets you tell you something about motivation. But if you don't know about the victim, you, you don't necessarily know what the motivation is. Like, what is that? So with all of these tools, why do socks have trouble? Because they do. They're, they're, they're horribly overloaded. Part of it is because we, we all like the puzzle. We love the, ar the art of having to figure out why this malware came in this time and how it exploited and why we didn't see it and all of those the puzzle pieces. So Josh on the, in the keynote speech talked about motivation, the motivations of hackers or uh, white hats and uh, the puzzler. And so a lot of us, I think most of us have that to a certain extent. It, like focusing on the internal stuff is boring. It really is. You want to focus on the, the person on the outside. We're unsure of how to prioritize. Uh, there is Every, every SOC design I've been a part of, the hardest part is getting someone to commit to, no, no, what's really important to you? What do you want me to focus on? And, and we don't have rules that help analysts do that. It just doesn't make sense. To many of us, uh, the analysts, it doesn't make sense. And I, a part of it is we're, we're our own worst enemies. SOC managers are, are part of the problem sometimes because they're so scared of, getting, of, of missing something that they can't decide that there's a priority. I, I literally had a, a SOC director of a 140,000 person organization worldwide tell me that, that when I was trying to force the discussion of, of, of priorities that every piece of malware and would be treated equally no matter where it ran or for who. We had to treat them all equally. We had to all investigate them and, and deal with them and clean them up equally. We would not treat people differently. We would not treat malware differently, period. And, and you can imagine what the, you know, we all sort of went, oh, okay, we'll try that. And you can imagine what the, the SOC queue looked like after the first month and after the third month because of that. It's really, if, if, you, can't, if you can't prioritize, you can't drop things. We struggle with indicator overload. The first, the first time we buy one of our half million dollar indicator feeds and turn it on and you get 50,000 things to worry about per week, it's really hard to figure out what to do with that. We don't know when to give up. When you have an incident that you're trying to track and, and you're not able to make a decision because you don't have the right information, sometimes it's better just to say, I accept this, I'm re-imaging and moving on even though I think it smells horrible and it could be something big because you don't have time. We don't have, we don't have exit criteria for analysts. And we spend a lot of time getting to root cause. I know it's necessary, you gotta figure out why you got, you, why you got hacked so you can build better prevention mechanisms and better detection mechanisms. So, and kill chain analysis helps you with root cause a lot too. But sometimes we spent way too much time on it and it's better just to, to, not, to not do it. And of course, the last piece is they don't understand their internal network. Every SOC I've been a part of, the ratio has been roughly on the order, you know, of anywhere between one to 10,000 internal devices, maybe at best one to for smaller socks, one to 1,000 internal devices. But the bigger socks are, are always gonna be maybe one to 5,000, one to 10,000 internal devices. So you'll have a sock covering 250,000 users worldwide and in literally 9,000 individual business units within that and they'll have 30 people trying to manage it. There's no way they can know about the different parts of the organization. So I, I know it sounds like I'm admiring the problem, I'm not, I'm just trying to to talk about what the, the limitations are. 
all of, the, all of these, actually I'll go back to this for a second, all of, all of these have something in common, which is that we, we have too much, to, there's, there's, there's a, we're, over, we're overwhelmed with the amount of choices we have to make, and we're trying to, to narrow these things down. So, some initial steps to start including targeting information into your SOC processes are pretty straightforward. And some of you, and I'd, I'd have to say probably most SOCs do a couple of these things already. Uh, and, and, but sometimes, not, sometimes it's accidental, sometimes it's deliberate. Uh, build into your process the idea that you have to collect information about target identity. And not just, not just during the incident, but in perpetuity. The idea of keeping all of your DHCP logs forever and all of your AD and every AD ch uh, group change forever, uh, and all of the um, all of your VPN, you know, external users VPN in ever forever is a, is a, it seems like an expensive pain in the ass, but compared to maintaining NetFlow and ex and browsing logs, it's actually not that bad. It's actually uh, it's often less data, and this this is the data that starts giving you your, that allows you to make decisions about internal context. So you have to commit to gathering data about your internal environment. So there's some really simple approaches that are just that you can, that most, most SOCs do early on anyhow because it helps them. Use, use these existing repositories of data, these exist, existing systems of record, and, and get them into your device. Integrate it into alerting at the simplest. You know, if you just have a, a list of directors and above and, and domain admins and Unix admins and make sure you get, put a little flag next to them on the, in your Xeom, you're, you're a step ahead of the rest. That's the very basic. This is, this is the one that's, that's really troubling to a lot of people, I think, which is the idea of knowing, your, knowing who your internal targets are in advance. I say targets there, it sounds external, I'm saying about us, about the, you, you the defender. There's two really radically different perspectives here. The, the, what the outsider sees of you and what you know about yourself. And, and you have to treat those differently because the, uh, depending on who the adversary is, they, they may really not have any good idea of internal, they might not have internal knowledge yet. And so they are going to have a very similar view of you to what a pen test would have of you. So when, when you have a pen test done, you should make sure that statement of work includes the idea that all of the recon ng and Maltigo information and perspective of what do I look like from the outside is part of the deliverable to the SOC and to the SOC database, whatever that is. Because that's the data that lets you say, hey, the outside world thinks I'm exposed here. So all of the, the, the pen tester's view of you needs to be part of the SOC data set. It shouldn't, be part of the, it shouldn't be part of the pen testing group or the compliance group. I mean, it's both, but you, you need to use it. And then there's also the internal knowledge perspective. From the outside, it looks like your R&D group is in Detroit, Michigan. And, and the reality is all the folks doing tr the, the really interesting scientific work and doing all the engineering is in Indonesia. Uh, but from the perspective of the papers that are written and the, the descriptions on your website, it's all Detroit. So it may make more sense to focus on the Detroit. It may make sense to focus on the Detroit uh, target as the place to maybe look a little closer. The reality is, though, uh, as, a, as an adversary gets to know you better, they're going to know soon enough that actually all of the cool IP that they want to steal is actually living on some engineer's desktop in Indonesia. It's not living in the research scientist's desk in Detroit. And the last is, uh, is obviously changes the, the incident handling process. Like, that's the, the fundamental part of this is that you can't do this unless you change the decisions you make along the way for each incident. So I had my, my simplified version of an incident response process there. And, and so this, I talked a little bit about that. In that detect phase, the simplest thing you can do is making sure you're incorporating target information into whatever your alerting mechanism is. That's a, probably going to be a rule in a ZM, but it might be something else. Right here, if you can change how you prioritize events based on target information, you will make your life so much easier. When you have 100 events that come in within an hour, every hour, and you only have enough analysts to do 50, if, you, if, if all else is equal, choose something to prioritize it. And, a, and, a, and if you're going to have to drop 50, drop 50 that aren't on the target list. It's a lot easier that way. It gives you a tool to shed work and focus, which 
as an analyst, I crave. I crave the ability to know, hey, I need to focus on this. I cannot worry about that. During your analysis phase, you need to be analyzing the target as well as all of the malware and exploit stuff. And, and, and more importantly, that the data about that analysis, you, it can't be lost. It has to be part of your big data solution that you're using to record all your beautiful DNS, HTTP, NetFlow logs, or whatever it is. When you make a note saying, oh, this guy's actually a research scientist, you know, whatever his name is in Indonesia or in Detroit, that that data needs to go in, into your permanent data storage so that the next time an incident comes up, it's flagged somewhere. That there's, when you do that little beautiful link analysis, someone says, hey, uh, Fred was targeted by this attack two years ago, and here's the notes we had on it. Or even better, this organizational unit is, you know, we've had multiple other incidents in this organizational unit, and here's the notes about that. You need, you need to ba basically include that in your analytic storage. And that's actually perhaps more here about the feedback here, is the idea of the feedback loop, that all of that data that you're getting for, for your target makes it back into whatever magic threat intel system you're using to make decisions about how we analyze the adversary. So all the, the difference is that all of a sudden when you look at your, at, at your crits instance or whatever, there's all of a sudden something that says, hey, there's something else in common between these two IP addresses or this single IP address and these people perhaps. They're both part of the same business unit. Maybe it's, you know, because sometimes the same IP might be a different person. Depending, you know, if it's a shared, if, if it's a lab PC, for example. And being able to say, hey, these are, these are people or working in the same organization. That tells you something. And then there's the other pieces. All of a sudden, you get added. You know, the, the, who's the actual user, the specific PC, and other things. So tying in those pieces of, of, of target information in your incident handling process and database make, allows you to narrow down what you're having to look at and allows you to make decisions about that, uh, that motivation path right here. So the, the idea is here, all of a sudden we have this other information about the specific business unit or PC or user that was associated with these pair of attacks. And for the first time, we maybe have a chance at drawing a conclusion about motivation. And the value in understanding the motivation is that it, it finally gives you, it, it both it sheds a little bit of light potentially on, on this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a risky, uh, it's, a, it's a risky thing because you're using the business unit to draw conclusions about up here, but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes that's valid. And, and then that then can inform more effectively the, the sorts of decisions you make going forward. Hey, I'm gonna really bump up the alerting on these three business units because that really seems to be the primary motivation of this adversary that's been targeting us every summer. So the, the advanced options are, are, fairly, are probably not gonna be too surprising to all of you, which is basically actively analyzing your internal groups. Treat your internal network as an intelligence problem. Hey, I'm noticing a pattern of increasing uh, zero, zero day activity over here. I'm gonna draw some conclusions about my internal network. I'm gonna say these guys over here are less secure. Treat those, uh, those pieces of an analytic deductive insight, put it back into whatever system you're using to analyze events because you don't, your, your company's too big to understand. You'll never understand it. You have to draw those little bits of analytic conclusion back into the incident handling process. Think about, uh, on the tech-centric approaches, and those are, what, those are the link diagram tools I was talking about, make sure you put in the, not just the, you know, the, the business organizations, but talk a little bit about the, um, talk a little bit about perhaps their, their even internal groupings. So like use group information to, to create some of those links. And so the, the risk here is that when you do this, it can get pretty, it can get pretty fuzzy fast. And it's, it's not something that's, that necessarily yields immediate results, but in the long term it helps you draw that picture. Hey, these are shared business units. You have to include the internal units. Some, some groups do a good job of that, but it seems a little foreign to use the threat intel tool to track your internal uh, data spaces. This is kind of controversial. This works more in, the, in, in a highly regulated, uh, non-privacy conscious co uh, country. Uh, the idea of tracking a internal user's connections as a way, as part of those connection diagrams, because I don't know how many of you have Jive or some other similar social networking tool that's internally built and you build connections inside of the company. I think most companies of like a thousand or more start having those sorts of things. 
mine your internal network for those connections between people. Because if they're the, you, may, you may not be able to find things through an active directory, but you may find it in the social connections. And, and this, of course, is the fundamental thing, all of that data. Don't, don't, tr don't necessarily treat the attacker data separate from the target data. Now, you have to tag it. You have to make it clear so you don't get yourself confused that you think one's an attack and one's on target. But the idea is that they should be part of a common data set that you can query and pivot on together. That you can make a query for something that includes both a, 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 some sort of selection based on target and some say, sorts of selection based on victim. So this, this, this is the feed, when, when we've tried doing this, when we've tried pushing socks in this direction, and again, these, these are basic, like, uh, the, these, are, these were socks that were just were sort of nascent, and we're trying to give them the tools to do this. Uh, it's amazing how comfortable people were, were with ambiguity on inter, about, in, about attacker information. Well, we know the C, C2 IP might be bad or might be not be, and we can accept that. We're going we're gonna to treat it 50-50, it's bad. There, people are incredibly confident about or comfortable dealing with ambiguity outside the organization, but they resist accepting it internally. I, I had like, knock down, drag out arguments with a, with a SOC architect about including their CMDB data in their, as part of the filter, you know, to, to add context to alerts in their ZM because he said, well, it's out of date. I'm like, yeah, I know it's out of date. You know, is it, is it, is 100% out of date? Is everything inaccurate? Yeah, clearly don't use it, but is it 50% out of date? 10%? Tell, help me understand. And the reality is, it wasn't that out of date. You know, there's, there's like 20% of the internal network that wasn't covered, and maybe 20% of it was wrong. But he, couldn't, he could not stomach the idea of using known flawed data in his, model, in his modeling of, of, of priority internally. And I, I think maybe a cultural thing, too. Uh, I definitely have found more resistant to more resistance to using uh, known flawed sources, using allowing ambiguity in Germany. They want yes or no. They want a clear criteria to make a decision. At least that was my perception with, with the companies there. That wasn't always there in the Middle East. Uh, There's a little bit more co comfort with the idea of ambiguity. Saying, so, yeah, if we can get a little bit boost of, of, of our ability to make decisions, that's good enough, even if it's not perfect. This is, this is that SOC, that SOC uh, manager who demanded that we treat all malware equally. And his fundamental, there's two things driving him. One was egalitarianism. We can't treat VIPs and administrators different from internal users. And the second was they could attack anywhere. And we can't assume that just because it's on a high value system, it's, you know, or a high value person or, or not, that one is more important than the other. And that's absolutely true. You know, that, that the first point of entry may just, may be a random person and then they move laterally which is a good argument for making sure you have instrumentation deeper in your network so you can pick up the lateral movement because the target of lateral movement is also a target. And so if you do have the triggers on those high value targets when you see it, see their name pop up in something that is a, uh, you know, a SMB share someplace or an attempt to move to a new system or a specific use of a password, when that happens, if you happen to have instrumentation deep in your network, you'll pick up that new connection, that, that, that hey, this, this is one of my high value targets and something bad happened. You may not care about weird, weird SMB traffic for regular users, but these eight scientists, you'll actually take a little look at, whatever it is. This is, uh, some people say, well, why would we want to include our old CMDB data in the, our old CMD data in, in the database? I don't, I don't get it. Why, why don't we just wipe it clean every time we get updates? And, and so the, the temptation is, again, we crave the knowledge about our internal systems. Why would I want to include old Active Directory information? Because A, being able to do retrospective analysis is pretty fundamental to figuring out why something happened. I, I can't tell you how many alerts where I, we found something bad, we found a, found a new piece of malware and a new C2 address, IP address, and then we go back and say, oh wow, these four systems over here beaconed there six months ago. And if you don't know what things looked like at that point, it's harder to draw a conclusion. So don't throw away your old data, just make sure you tag it. Hey, Active Directory looked like this on this date and looked like this on that date. And this, so this is the last one, this is the one I struggle with the most, is because no, uh, particularly in the uh, Works Council centric um, EU privacy rules, regulations, um, 
German Datenschutz pressures, all of those things drive a, a good desire to protect the internal people within a company. And so this looks an awful lot like you're targeting your internal users and that you're, you're trying to do something to them, not for them. And so if there's a way that you can, if there's a way that you can reduce that, reduce, re, you know, re reduce that, you, you may have to make compromises on that. This, this is honestly the one I struggle with the most. Uh, on, a few, on, a few, on a few occasions, we haven't been able to do target-centric tracking because of this. And in some cases, uh, we had a works council that was really willing to have that discussion and will, willing to, to allow us to do a little bit more once they understood and understood that it was fully auditable and reviewable by them as well as us. So I probably finished too early with apologies, uh, which is good because I would love feedback. And so, uh, so my questions to you that I, I would really appreciate you, you being able to talk to me about is, did this help you at all? Uh, do, you, do any of you share a perception of these gaps? Like, do you, have you seen similar problems in your own organizations? Uh, have you seen people using some of these techniques in your environments? Because I have a limited data set. I've seen, you know, like I said, maybe 10 or 20 stocks where I've seen it. Haven't seen too many papers about using internal threat intelligence tools. I mean, external threat intelligence tools internally, but I suspect that there's probably someone who's doing similar things already. Uh, what other problems do you see that I'm missing here? Because I'm sure the, those, these are the problems I saw. I didn't have a long list, because it, the, res, the resistance usually wasn't too high, because it's an, it's, it's an easy step to take. And uh, what would you, if, if there was a follow-on work to this, what, what should it be? Should it be practical uh, demonstrations of the actual ties between crits plus OSIM plus um, plus elk, what does that look like? How those three tools work together? If there's a, if you're, if you're doing a internally, uh, internally focused detection mechanisms, I don't know. I need, please, please tell me. And again, you can contact me here. I, I have business cards. I'm happy to, happy to chat about this anytime. Uh, and again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm open for questions. Also, please. Yes, do you, I share your uh, perception, right? Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Uh, let's get a little bit louder. Uh, I share your perception. What are the other problems do you see? I see the problem you, s you mentioned. Uh, we are doing penetration tests and we have no standard where you can automatically dig into the results of the penetration test for a cert, for example, so we can export it to a cert and they can somehow Consume Manage it. it. Yeah. So there is a standard missing, which is uh, above all technologies, uh, vendor independent, where any penetration tester can put its results into a database. I think that I think that's true. I think I would I would I think I would start maybe if I had to guess would be uh, would say that both Recon NG and Multigo do a pretty good job of giving formatted output if you want that, and that's just a piece of the. The attacker perspective, admittedly, it's just a small chunk, but it, but it's, it's good at, it, if you can figure out how to cons consume both of, both of those, and literally Recon NG can be just a list of, of email addresses and a list of domain names uh, as much as anything else. And so you can, it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of work to, to import that. But, so, but, I, but I hear your point, there is no standard way of doing it. You have to take a shortcut and do it. Because from my experience, the, the, res the results of any penetration tests are in a doc document. And that's yeah. simply not parsable. So no, you would need something like an XML, HTML output you can import, you can parse. I, I, I agree. That's why I was, I, one of the things I mentioned is that you have to push for, like a lot, of, a lot of pen testing groups will be willing to give you working papers. And presumably they have, as part of it, those recon NG results or something else in some, some form of output. So hopefully that, that can do it, but that, that's, that has a lot to do with a company's relationship with the pen testing team and the, the signed agreement, the willingness to give up data, the, the raw data. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I see that a lot of this introspection would re rely on logging essentially. Uh, but uh, new attack methods move uh, to towards uh, in-memory attacks, which are quite difficult to log and uh, forensically analyze. And I wonder if you have some comments on, on those developments, like PowerShell. So I, I think that 
I, I, I agree it's getting tougher to pick up uh, indicators on the endpoints, in particular because of the in memory issue. The fact that folks are willing to give up persistence because they know they have a good drive-by download that they'll get, they'll, they'll, get a sh they'll, they'll pop a new shell in the next week if they just wait. Or VDIs are forcing people to just accept the fact that persistence is useless. Uh, I, I come long ago from the network background, so ultimately if, 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 you can't, if you can't find it on the endpoint easily, you have to go back to the network. And a lot of our indicators are network centric. And, and the network centricity of indicators works also for, uh, for the victims. Like the victims are often, they, they, there's, there's network based characteristics of the victims, IP addresses, where they're located, you know, the system is tied to a person for a given time period. So you can, if, you, if you're forced away from the endpoint log data, you, you have to rely on the ties of the network indicators. And then, it's, you, know, then you, you end up with a harder problem, though. And you're absolutely right about it. Anything else? There are several companies now shifting into the SOC as a service business. And recapping your talk, you're basically telling me they are totally inefficient. Oh, God, no. I, I'm, hopefully, I'm not, I'm not saying that because that's, that's a, cause I work for a company that sells managed security service. And, and I'm actually on the team that does that. So one of the things about, um, and uh, this isn't a sales pitch for FireEye, because that we have flaws just like any other, uh, any other company. One of the things I loved about FireEye is the fact that they've, they've built such a good, such good modeling of the attackers that they can afford to give up a little knowledge on the target. And so, uh, but, but with that said, the, 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 there's lots of MSSPs that, that aggressively seek and incorporate customer data that say, hey, give me, I, you, know, you know, hey, it's January, could you give me your Active Directory listing and your, and your, you know, and your CMDB and XXX, and they can also track, like, track the historical patterns of compromise well. Again, this isn't just about knowing, being able to know, being about being able to analyze. So for example, there was a MSSP, not FireEye, that, that had a really great, uh, really great SOC workflow engine that any time they, you know, an internal IP came up in their, in their, in their, their highly customized uh, version of RT, you could you know, get a nice mouse over and it would show you that, you know, context about that IP or network based on previous incidents. Hey, this looks like this is their internal um, their turn you know, this is their data, uh, their data VLAN, or this is their 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 web their web app VLAN, or something. So that that like the idea that as an MSSP, I can also build context about the customer without the customer telling me anything, just based on the pattern of log events and historical analysis. So I, I, I agree with you that as an MSSP, you have a challenge in that you are one step away from the customer. But a lot of these things are not dependent on actually having access to the customer. It's, it's about having access to the data feeds. And as an MSSP, you probably have those anyway. Anybody else? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>